Hello, welcome to the Blythe Tapes again. Uh, I'm delighted to say that my guest today is the crime writer Russ Thomas. Uh, Russ is the author of the very successful Fire Watching, which I've got here in lovely hardback, and the forthcoming Night Hawking, which is uh, uh, not out yet, so I haven't had a chance to read it yet, not officially out yet. Um, Russ uh, lives in Sheffield, where he sets his books, and he was born in the south of England, and uh, born in, in Essex, raised in Berkshire and now lives in Sheffield and he's done a lot of other um, things in the past uh, as well as, uh, as as being a writer. Um, lots of these things that writers have on their CVs as we tend to have. Russ, welcome to the Blythe Tapes. Thank you very much. Hi Dan, how are you? All right, thanks. Yes, great. Good, um, good to see you. Um, so yeah, I think People are always interested in the other things that we do, aren't they? They're fascinated by, you know, do you write full time and this sort of thing. And uh, you, uh, <laughs> you, um, you had the, you had the very interesting job of being a bookseller. So um, how, how was that for you? Um, yeah, I used to love, I, I used to love it. I, I used to love the, uh, the dealing with the customers part of it, which was kind of the main part. But yeah, um, it was great. I just it was able to talk to people about books all day. People have um, a sort of strange idea I think of booksellers as having lots of time to sit around reading all day and it's not like at all. Um, but you do at least get to talk about books all day to people which is nice yeah it's it's a bit different from I mean I, I think that people who I get the impression that certainly in, in the shop that, that you worked in um, people there have a genuine enthusiasm for books and they're not just there because they want to work no. in retail they're people who are actually interested in the process of book selling and in reading and writing and so can speak to yeah. in an informed kind of way about what they do absolutely and I don't think that's unique to where I work so I think that's booksellers the world over but yes. certainly the country over i've worked in lots of bookshops and it's always like that yes. um <clears throat> usually find that i think compared with other retail jobs you get people in them who actually are passionate about what they're doing so you don't always get that in a clothes shop or you know a, a shop that sells pots or whatever it's, it's, yeah. it's a job to them. whereas i think people in order to sell books you really have to be interested in books and and uh, and sort yeah. of switched yeah and how have your uh, friends and colleagues in the bookselling fraternity taken to your newfound success on the other side of the oh, they, fence, so to speak? Yeah, they've been so supportive. It's It's been lovely. Um, yeah, couldn't have asked for, for more support. They always get behind me. There was when my debut came out, the Sheffield branch, uh, which is one I worked in most often, did a huge window display and a, a great big table. <laughs> so it was something quite magical and special to see that. It was great, yeah. So you're either gamekeeper turned poacher or poacher turned gamekeeper, okay. depending on which way round you want to see this uh, thing. But um, that's a bit of both. I don't a bit know. Of both. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, fire watching's been enormously successful for you. I mean, uh, I think um, it's it's something that you know writers have at the back of their mind the thought that they might be successful, and we always have these doubts about ourselves as well, don't we? And um, and I've been doing this for for twenty years, and I've had some books that have performed really well, and others that haven't performed as well. And so you go into it kind of blind don't you really and then you, you pu publishers make these huge claims as to how things are going to go but you're never quite sure it's going to happen until you see it no that's right and and of course it feels very different like on the other on the other side of it yeah I mean it has been successful um but you're always looking for the next success aren't you, you always want you always want something bigger you you know and and it doesn't mean that the the negative reviews don't hurt or the uh, you know the times where it's not sold um largely because of covid mm. and things like that. um those those things do affect you too but i'm i'm very very pleased with the way that people have received it and it's been it's been fantastic you know yes it's the, the vast majority of people have, have really loved it and yeah um yeah it it's kind of it's a dream come true i know that sounds really cliche and horrible but it's the thing i spent years dreaming about and and now it's happening um, yeah. and that's an incredible place to be in it's great to be i mean you know um a lot of people who who aren't writers don't realize how long these things take i mean you you're publicized as you know a, a, an overnight success and yet we know yeah. that you know a decade or, or more of, of work went into this and uh you well, and I indeed yeah and 
you know that full well, having read a, a version of Bio Watching at yep. a very early stage many should, years ago. I should say for people who don't know that Russ and I first met um, when I was very briefly his tutor on the uh, MA at um, Sheffield Hallam University in creative writing. And uh, I was privileged to read a very early version of, of what became Fire Watching. I think it was it was already called Fire Watching at that point. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, the title's uh, never really changed. Never changed. Just about yeah. everything else has. The, the name of the protagonist changed and uh, some of the structure <laughs> changed. Um, but well, we'll talk about the MA in a moment, but going back even further than that, uh, I remember you mentioning that this didn't even start life as a crime novel. It started as the story of the two old ladies who are supporting characters in the book. And so how did that evolve from that story of, of those women into being uh, a, a crime fiction novel? Yeah, it, there, there are two, two um, elderly uh, women in the book called Lily and Edna, um, who have lived together um, pretty much all their lives, certainly since the war. And, and um, it, they're kind of involved with the crime in the book and, and connected to it in a way that's not entirely clear when, when the book starts and, and it becomes clearer as you, as you read on. Um, it's but actually, about these things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we want to give people give yeah. people a hint right. of spoilers. Right, yeah. to find out more. Yeah. Um, but it, yeah, it started Lily. In fact, Edna wasn't there. It was just Lily. It was a, a short story I wrote about an elderly woman um, suffering from dementia of some kind, sort of non-specified version of dementia, in a care home towards the end of her life, just dipping in and out of the past, revisiting past events, and through that you the reader found out more about her life or got glimpses of her life um it was quite a short story only a few pages long but um the character kind of stuck with me and i i always knew there was more about her i didn't know and and there were more secrets in her past that hadn't come to light in that in that story and there wasn't room to explore them in that story so, so you, uh, yeah. yeah it kind of started life there and then I, it came back to me when I started the MA and I, I was looking for an idea for a story. She was one of the main characters um, and then it grew from there. Um, uh, it turned into a crime novel a bit later on when I was sort of forced to come up with a plot because there, was, there wasn't anything going on. And I they thought, make us do this, <laughs> make us have yeah, plot in our novels, yeah. Um, so what was um, your... So yeah, I threw a body in. Yes. What was your main motivation for doing the MA in creative writing? Because I know there'll be people watching this who'll be thinking about doing that sort of thing. People who've got a uh, manuscript and they're thinking about, you know, validating it in that way. So what was it that drew you to doing the MA? I think I wanted to know a bit more about how to do it. I, I always knew I wanted to write a book and I've written a book before. Um, as a teenager, I'd written one. Um, I'd written one, another kind of as a young adult. Um, and I, but I, I felt very much like I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, it turns out no one knows what they're doing and, and there aren't really any rules, but it's something it's quite nice to hear someone tell you that or, or to guide you. I mean, there are rules, of course there are rules, but you break those rules all the time, but it, you need to know them, don't you? And before you can break them and, and break them on purpose. So yeah, it was that, it was about a gesture almost to myself that I was taking my writing seriously and I wanted to do it as more than a hobby and, and, and I found it really useful for that. What I wasn't really expecting and what I got out of it was the huge network of people that you meet, um, other students, uh, tutors, people who come and visit the, the university for guest lectures and things like that. And um, that, was, that was invaluable. And, and it was, I suppose the main thing was, was for the first time I was calling myself a writer. And although I wasn't published, I, I could call myself a writer and, and, and sort of feel like I was doing the job, even if I wasn't being paid for it yet. It's a very important thing to do, I think. When we start out, we're always a bit nervous about calling ourselves writers and people, I was the same. If you have a day job, you talk about the day job first of all, and then your writing comes up almost hesitantly in, in passing. Um, but I know what you mean about the yeah. networking because I, and I joined the Society of Authors and been to a few of their events. And really the, the, the networking side of that is, is more important than anything you go to the conferences for and just the, the sort of chatting over coffee is, is, is really good and that's where I made writer connections because it, it can be quite a solitary job can't it and you have to be very well, that's it. motivated. You do spend a lot of time on your own making stuff up being in your own head and that's not always a healthy place to be. No. <laughs> 
very strange kind of job yeah yeah, yeah but, but and also the people who are in your life don't always get it you can't you can't have these conversations with your mum or your partner or um the dog no. uh, because they don't they don't write they, they might read and they might get it that far but but writing's a very particular um pastime i suppose and and unless you're talking to other people who write it's very difficult to have those conversations and, and make them understand where you're coming from and what you're trying to do totally very um, difficult to explain how it works i mean in in artistic terms and in business terms as well and if you have friends who work in more conventional jobs and they try to see it in terms of of, of their jobs and you can't really always explain it <laughs> yeah yeah but i'm i'm interested in um the the idea that you chose to write a crime novel because i think and you, you might agree with me about this that um there is a certain kind of snobbery in literary kind of elites you know people who write literary fiction look down on on genre fiction and as someone you know i i write children's and i write supernatural and i write sci-fi um thinking about say the comment that martin amos made a few years ago about children's fiction and you think he said something ridiculous like I'd, I'd need to have a lobotomy to write a children's book which was you know offended every single children's writer on the planet um and then you have say ian McEwan, you know doing what is essentially a, a sci-fi novel um and you said in an interview something like um it's not a sci-fi novel about moon boots and laser guns you know it's uh, it's exploring artificial intelligence and i thought well just like philip k dick did 40 years ago you mean you know yeah. so there is this kind of sense that it's not proper unless it's done by the literary elite i mean have you had any 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 sense of having to justify you know this is a genre which is just as valid as any other no to be honest i don't think i have um i was aware of that of, of, of what you what you describe there um, and it is a perception that we have, but I don't think I've ever come across it um, in a in a personal context. But then I suppose I wouldn't. Um, I, I certainly came across it in the bookshop. Uh, there were customers who would only read one type of of novel, um, or or even not novels at all, because mm. they're only interested in one type of book. Yeah. Um, but that will always be the case, won't it? There, there are always people who we need to focus down on one one area and it's true of crime novels of course there are lots of people who only read crime novels and swear by it and think that no other novel is is worth touching i'm not like that i read all kinds of things but i understand um, yeah. um, but it, it it's not yeah i've not come across it in no one said no no one's i've not been at any literary parties not i've been to any literary parties but um yeah I, i've not come across and been frowned upon or looked down upon I, I think it's a bit of an old-fashioned idea really perhaps yeah. it was more common in the literary salons of the 50s I mean, 60s or, or later yeah it is an old-fashioned idea but there are still people who are propagating it i think that was that was my point yeah um, but uh, yeah I, I think it's you know it's very hard to write a crime novel and you know, having done myself what is essentially a whodunit but set in in the future so i kind of mm. got away from some of the tropes of it i know how hard it is to do because you are holding back a lot of information to from your readership and you have to to you know keep the uh, the intrigue and the mystery going which obviously you have to do in in all kinds of, of writing too but it, it is very much dependent on that process of teasing and revelation and misdirection and so on isn't it so you're very much kind of plot driven it is um i i don't i don't know if that differs enormously from like like you say from other other types of novel the, the we we we're human beings we like to put labels on things don't we but actually writing story in fact not even novel writing but the way story works is very similar in in all its different formats and and there's always a case where you're trying to keep seek hold secrets back from the reader trying to drip feed information in setting things up for later um perhaps it's more overt in a crime novel i don't know but or, or perhaps people are looking for it more in a crime novel That's what it is so perhaps you have to be a bit cleverer about hiding the truth yeah but. and i mean you had to do a lot of research as well if you're, if you're choosing to do a contemporary crime book then you have to do research about police procedure and so on um yeah. and you've got your your hero ds adam tyler who is part of this uh, cold case review unit which you've obviously you know you, you've made up which is fine mm -hmm. um but apart from that you have to get your police procedure right um i remember we had a conversation about this the little details like the fact that uh police still use cassette tapes for their interviews and people might assume that they they do them digitally but of course cassette tapes are 
less liable to be tampered with. So uh, mm -hmm. it makes much more sense. So um, you did a lot of research about this, trying to, to get those details right. Yeah, I, I, I'm not, I'm not massively into research because <laughs> it tends, it, it holds me up when I'm writing. It, it's the sort of stuff that gets in the way of imagination. Mm -hmm. But you do, of course, you do have to do it at some stage and and go back and try and, and make things work. You have to. My, my biggest problem is stopping it from interrupting the story or, or yeah. being so showing so in your face that you know that it's it ends up reading like a a. a deposition by a police constable in a in a courtroom you know I was proceeding in a westerly direction my lord and you, you don't want that all that jargon and stuff but it's about putting enough in that you get a flavor um, and that people believe it's real it's not yeah. real of course it's very different you couldn't write a crime novel well I, I, I say couldn't I'm sure there are people who do write crime novels that are much more procedurally follow follow sort of procedure um, but that's not what I'm into. I'm into writing a story and then trying to make people believe it's real. So I, yeah. I hope I've got away. I'm sure I've made mistakes. Um, I'm sure people will point them out to me, whether people I want to do. or not. There are people but, out there uh, who love to do this sort of thing, but uh, it is yeah. very much about, I mean, when, you, when you're writing a contemporary crime novel, isn't it? Because you, you, um, you, I mean, you've got to, you, can, you can make choices. You can either have it, set in the present day, or you can, can do a historical crime book, or you can do a futuristic one, or you can do something like Agatha Christie did in Then There Were None and have an isolated island, um, which was essentially mm -hmm. the trick that I stole for exiles, just have them isolated and have to so solve the crime themselves. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, you know, I think your research shows as much as it needs to, and we're interested in the characters and the story, as you say, and it is, it is, a, it is a novel, um, and that's really it's, important. It's still presumably you still have to do a lot of research for something like exiles because you're um you, you've got to i mean i i've read exiles and it's brilliant but you've got to really um you've got you've got to know how things would work it might be a fantasy arena it might be a planet that no one's been to but there are still rules aren't there there, there yeah. are rules of physics and, yeah, it's, and it's, things, unless you decide to break them and then you have to tell the reader how you're breaking them and why that's right. That's right. It's all world building, isn't it? I mean, I say this yeah. to, to writing students as well. I mean, you you are building a believable world. Um, if your stories, whether your stories, you know, set in Victorian London or, you know, in the present day or, you know, somewhere in, in a distant galaxy, the world that you're writing in has to be believable and your reader has to be able to buy into that. And you almost need this kind of telepathic connection with your reader that they're going to believe what, what you're writing, um, because if they don't, then it's very easy just to put the book down and, and throw it away. Um, and that's what we're up against, really, isn't it? The, uh, um, the, the, the fear that people are not going to read our books is not, not, I think that's more so than they're going to read it and hate it. It's the fear that they're not going to read it at all, perhaps. Uh, the fear of being, being ignored, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's set in contemporary Sheffield. Um, as I say, you've, you've, you've taken some interesting uh, liberties with the geography, which is great. And uh, you've done some, some, you've got some real life places. There are pubs and streets that people will, will recognize. Um, you, you invented a, a small uh, town called Castle Dean. Um, tell us how this came about. This is an interesting story, why you had to create uh, this, this place and where you, where you put it. Uh, yeah, I don't think I necessarily, oh, well, I did have to, yes, I know what you're referring to, yeah, so it, it turned out, so in an early draft, someone pointed out to me, because I, I very much wanted the, the police are South Yorkshire based, they're Sheffield based, but Sheffield sits right on about the county boundary, for those who don't know, it's, it's about as south in South Yorkshire as you can get, and the next county is Derbyshire, and um, most of the Peak District, where the countryside is, is, is Derbyshire. And someone pointed out to me, I've got this murder, this body found in a in a um, house in a cellar, bricked up in a cellar of a country sort of mansion um, in the Peak District. And somebody, may even have been you, I can't remember, pointed out that uh, I don't think it was. I think it was earlier than you. <laughs> pointed out that if if uh, a body was found in Derbyshire, it wouldn't be investigated by South Yorkshire Police it would only be it would be investigated by Derbyshire Police so this threw me for about 10 minutes thinking time and then I thought I tell you what I'll just make up a village that sits right on the boundary <laughs> so that South Yorkshire can investigate but it it's it's a it's a very image of a Derbyshire village just in the Peak District kind of thing so yeah we always find so a solution 
This is the thing. We're, we're making things up. We're allowed to find solutions like that. And uh, I'm quite glad I did it as well, yeah. because it, the, the feel of the village is that it has this sort of Agatha Christie feel. Everyone's a suspect in the yeah. village and it's not. Yeah. They're all a bit dubious. So I, I, I'm glad I didn't put that on a real place necessarily. I think I think a city the size of Sheffield can can sustain a few villains and a few nasty people. But but a smaller place, perhaps it's nicer that it's not a real place that people can go and, you know. And it's also, a, it, it's also a very clever way of narrowing down your, your cast of, of suspects, isn't it? Because then you haven't got a, a whole city to deal with. But I mean, um, yes. I don't want to, yeah. I risk, I risk giving too much away about your story, which we don't want to do. But um, when, um, so you, you'd, uh, when you when you had a, a version of firewatching that, that you were more or less happy with, you wanted to send it out there into the market, you weren't looking for uh, agents, editors. Give us a bit of a flavour of how that went for you. You got an agent first of um, all. Yeah, I mean, it went terribly at first because I, I started sending my book out um, probably getting on for 10 years ago now when I first started sending it out. And um, I got lots of politely worded rejections. Um, I met an agent through uh, the MA that I did at Hallam and um, oh, and and I won a prize through Waterstones as well, uh, so a sort of booksellers prize and I met an agent through that and they agreed to read my work and were very lovely about it but said it wasn't quite ready, it wasn't for them, um, which is pretty much standard response. Really. Whatever else they tell you, what they mean is it's not ready yet, um, go away and try again. Yeah. So I rewrote it a few times. I put it away in a drawer for well over a year um, and went and wrote an another novel completely. Uh, and then um, a mutual friend of ours, Susan Elliott Wright, was the one who encouraged me and said, you keep going, you keep talking about this novel, go back to it. No one's seen it in its current form, brush it up, send it out again. So I said, yeah, you're right, I should do. And um, whatever I'd done in that, that last brushing up, obviously made the difference um, and I or perhaps it was just the discipline of having written another novel and learned a bit more about writing and then when I went back to it I just kind of it worked so I, I sent it out to three agents um, heard back from one almost instantly um, and that's who I went with in the end an agent called Sarah Hornsley who was just brilliant and really got what I was trying to do and then she said to me, I really get what you're trying to do, I love it, but, <laughs> and uh, there were sort of a couple of things that she won, she felt I could improve or could think about, and I went away and worked on it again for another sort of six months or so, um, sent it back to her, she sent it out to publishers, and we got a response within 24 hours um, from one publisher who said, I love it, I think it's brilliant. Um, and eventually it went to auction. So over the course of the next sort of couple of weeks, it went to auction, um, which is kind of the dream, isn't it? That everyone hopes for that, that, that you're going to get. And I mean, that's a, yeah. the best kind of agent to have. I and mean, my agent is very similar. She won't let anything go out until it is absolutely right. And, and your agent takes an, an almost an editorial interest and, you know, will, will say, right, you need to fix this, 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 go away and do this, work on it for a few weeks or a few months, and then we can then we can send it out. Um, so yeah. you know, you're very lucky to to have that to be on the same wavelength as your agent and I, I am with mine as well and I, I know authors who've had unhappy relationships with their agents and it's it's not been good and that's been something which has caused their careers to to derail so it's yeah very I, think, I think there are I'm sure that there are agents who who put more work in than others I, I feel I'm lucky that I have an agent who does do it puts a lot of work in um, but I also think sometimes writers don't want to listen because they want to think it's their work it's their baby and I understand that but on the other hand if you're sending it out into the world it becomes not just your property anymore it becomes um you know something that people are going to comment on and, and look at and judge and these people are experts they know what they're talking about they know what sells they know yeah um the sorts of things readers are looking for and, and that includes agents and editors and, and the marketing people and all those kinds of people you do have to listen to them you have to trust them yeah this is yeah. the live tapes and i'm talking to russ thomas who is the author of fire watching and the forthcoming night hawking and we're talking about uh, genre and uh, 
and selling books and uh, and being published and getting agents and all sorts of exciting things. Um, so you had a very positive experience with the, the publishing world, and uh, you uh, your book's been. Um, published by Simon and Schuster. It's out in hardback, it's out in paperback, it's out as an ebook. Um, then of course, with the success, you have to start thinking, okay, this is no longer a standalone book. It's going to be the first in a series. So it then evolves. You have to think, okay, well, I've got to write the second book. So the process of writing the second book, you obviously had done a lot of it already, but presumably it was quite different from the process of, of writing the first. Yes, it was. Uh, I, I always knew that Firewatching was, well, I'd sort of planned for it to be the first in a trilogy, mm. uh, sort of loose trilogy. It's, it's that they, the books are connected by um, sort of the main character's backstory, but, but the, each one stands alone in terms of the story that it's telling within that novel. Mm. Um, so I'd got some plans for the second one, and obviously part of getting the deal is your agent says to you, right, we're going to need we're going to need a second one. You've got to you've got to come up with something. So I'd hurriedly put together a synopsis and, and made up some stuff. Uh, but then I yeah, all, all of a sudden you've got to deliver another book in less than a year, really, as opposed to the ten years it took me to write the first one. <laughs> Yes, it's a common experience. It's quite frightening, isn't it, to have that? Yeah, it's incredibly but, frightening, and you don't know if you can do it. You know, you you now know your your kind of your anxieties and and worries uh, morph. So they go from being about whether you can write a book to whether you can write a book again. And that sounds silly, but it, it's a subtle difference in those. Absolutely, things. it is very very different. Tell us about night hawking. Give us a give us a quick few pointers as to what we, what we can look forward to enjoy in night hawking. Night Hawking is uh, well. It's back. It's same characters. That that's one advantage I did have that I I was at, the characters were already set up, um, and it opens with a metal detectorist uh, who's uh, gone out in the middle of the night and climbed into Sheffield's botanical gardens um, searching for something and discovers more than he bargained for in the um, in terms of a a corpse that, that is dug up. So it start, yeah. starts there and um and again in, in a recognizable location, of course, which people will know yeah. if they live in the area. Yes. You know Sheffield, you know the botanical gardens, yeah. Um so apologies to the to the botanical gardens who were lovely as well and really um showed me around and gave me a tour and helped me out and said, pointed out places and said, Oh, that would be a really good place for a um, which <laughs> was brilliant. Um, I feel a bit guilty for having can bury a body in this flower bed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that's the sort of gist. And uh, our hero, uh, Adam Tyler, is called in. It, it's cold case related, and he gets called in to uh, to investigate um, along with his protege, Mina. Um, and yes, and it develops, picks up as well on the kind of things that I'd hinted at in book one regarding. His past, I won't say any more about that, but you, you, it picks up on that and, and runs with it a bit further. Fantastic. Okay, well, I've been talking to Russ Thomas on the Blythe Tapes. Um, Russ is the author of, as I mentioned, Fire Watching and the forthcoming Night Hawking, uh, published by Simon Schuster. And uh, Russ, if you want to find more out about him, he's on Twitter at The Voice of Russ. And his website is russthomasauthor.com. That's right, isn't it? So I shall put that up on the screen well done. to have a look at. Um, and I shall flash that up for people to read. So um, just a quick pointer now, Russ, as to what you've been working on since. We've got another Adam Tyler novel in the pipeline coming up and uh, almost done. Yeah, there's a third, third novel is um, sat right next to me now um, and uh, is currently, um, well, at a in a state of disarray but it will be sorted out <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, <laughs> and does it have does it have a single word gerund title like the other two has it got an um, it does but i'm not fixed on it yet so um have to wait and see but i think this if if, if it does end up with that this will be the last one that does um if i go on writing more i don't think i can keep coming up with do go on writing more. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I have to ask you one last question because I'm sure there are people who are going to be wanting to ask this. If you're picturing your, a future television adaptation, who would be your ideal mm -hmm. actor to play Adam Tyler? Do you have an um, ideal person in mind or a type of I, I, in mind? I honestly don't. Um, I think I perhaps did when I started writing it years ago, um, but those people would be 
uh, pro probably too long in the tooth to play Adam Tyler now. Um, I suspect it'll be someone we've never heard of if it happens, and I will be very happy. And I'm sure it will be brilliant, whoever they cast. I don't massively describe Tyler in the book, so um, it's, it's really open to interpretation what he looks like. Um, I did that deliberately, not for the film people, or the DV people, but for the reader so that, you know, you can imagine him as you want to. Yeah, very important. Yeah. Yeah. Russ, thank you very much. Um, I've been talking to Russ Thomas on the Blythe Tapes, as I mentioned. Uh, go and look up his books, Firewatching, Nighthawking. Russ, thank you very much for your time today. Thanks, Dan.